every night. I said, every night? She says, yeah. They don't have television, internet, no satellite dish. There's nothing to do. They go to church. And I thought, wow. And, and, and one day we walked by. It was in the middle of the week, and it, it wasn't where, where she lived. It was in a different area. And there was a little tiny hut filled with people. I said, what's that? She said, that's a church. And, and what they do is they go on visitation. You know, visitation is simple in Honduras. The Christians go to church every night. So you meet and pray and sing, and then you go on visitation. Anybody that's not in church needs to be visited. And so it's very simple who to visit. All the people that are home because they weren't in church and they're probably not a Christian. And so it's just, that's how life is. It's simplified. Um, and then one of the blessings of the ministry, you know, the gospel is for individuals. God saves people one at a time. He doesn't save groups. He saves individuals. Uh, in, in the poorest area, uh, there are these people that live in the dump, and they just eat the food that's dumped from the garbage trucks, and they drag the tires and pile them and make their houses. But they have a lot of hardship there. And there was one boy uh, who was, seven, well, he wasn't little, he was 17, but he got in a fight with someone with a baseball bat, and they just, you know, broke compound fractured right down his arms and so he was he was uh, he had something wrong with his hand but he ended up in the hospital and there for the first time he experienced the love of Christ and and the the nurse that brought him in also let him stay in her house while he recovered and shared the gospel and led a 17 year old you know broken arm recovering disfigured hand little boy and what he said was it was the first time he experienced love. You see, we have a powerful ministry by sharing the love of God in Jesus Christ. And, and what a joy to think what the Lord will do with one little light living in that dump and, and uh, having his love. So what a blessing. But let's open our Bibles to Revelation. Uh, as you're opening to Revelation, I want to remind you of what we saw two weeks ago, and that is the very first word defines what the whole book is about. The first word is apocalypsis, the word translated revelation. It means to unveil, to uncover, to take the lid off. Now, I want you to think of, of the content of this book in light of how God introduces it to us. God says, I am opening to you. I am revealing to you. I'm taking the lid off. Now, imagine someone came to your house uh, to visit you, and they brought one of those big white paper boxes, and it says Rixies across the front. So immediately you'd know something good is inside, right? And they come and they say, look what I brought you. And they reach to the front of the box, holding it, and they lift the lid. What they've done is you know there's something special, you just don't know quite what it is, and they have revealed it to you. That's what this book is. It's God saying there's something special that I have given you the next word is in Jesus Christ, and I just want to lift the lid off. I want to unveil and show you the beauty, the wonder, the greatness, the treasure that Jesus Christ is. And so, chapter one is God pulling the lid off the box and saying, this is what Jesus is doing right now, today. Chapter two and three is God opening the box and saying, and this is what Jesus sees in his church right now. And then chapter four on is wonderful. It's God saying, hey, as you look out, in the first century, they were looking at all of the conflict going on in the Roman Empire. And remember, Nero killed himself, committed suicide, and then Nerva, and I forget all of them. I memorized them back when I was in, in history class. But all those emperors, one after another, there was civil war and everything going on, and people were looking out wondering what's going on, and the church was being persecuted. And God says, hey, and he lifts the lid in chapters 4 through 22 and says, look, I have a plan. I am, as it says in, in the Old Testament, I am watching over my word to perform it. See, the blessing of Revelation 4 to 22, when God lifts the lid off and shows us the future, what he tells us is it's his plan. He's going to accomplish it. We don't have to worry about it. It doesn't matter what our view of it is. It's going to happen exactly as he has planned it. And he says, I want you to trust me. See, the people then were scared about who is going to be the next empire or emperor? And today we wonder whether if Libya's oil gets cut off and it goes to Saudi Arabia, are we going to pay $9 a gallon like they pay in, in England? God says, no matter what happens, I have a plan. 
and I know what's going to happen, and I've prepared for you just what you need. Not to, to have everything you want, but to accomplish my purpose in this world. And so God unveils Jesus Christ in chapters 1, 2, and 3 in his church, 4 through 22, consummating his plan for the ages. And each of these sections of Revelation has a disclosure. Now, now think about the fact, Revelation doesn't have anything new in it. I don't know if you realize that. There are 404 verses. Everything, every concept, every, every element is somewhere else in the Bible. Revelation just puts it all into a box and God shows it in a fresh, new way. But what's interesting is God shows us what he wants us to know from all the information that's scattered through the Bible about Christ, about Christ's church, and about the future. It's very interesting how he summarizes, how he puts together in this beautiful package his plan, his church, and the person of Christ. And that's this whole book. So what we could say is the summary of the book of of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, is God knows we need reminders, so he reminds us what's important about this whole other 65 books. And he puts them all concisely as a reminder to his servants. And the setting is, if you look at the end of verse 1, He sent and signified it by his angel to John. You see, the the essence of of this book is that it didn't flutter down like this, you know, and and plop down, or someone didn't dig it up in New York somewhere like Joseph Smith. We're talking about God sent it through a man, and his name was John. And that man was, was needing to have that disclosure. You see, The reason I know John needed this is because God's very intentional. John was on the island of Patmos. He was a political prisoner. He was going through great struggles. Think about who he is. John the Apostle, he was a fisherman from a small seaside town in Galilee. He was called by Jesus to follow him all of his life, and he did. And look what he got. He is now alone, banished on Patmos. He's on a prison colony island off the coast of Turkey, modern-day Turkey, ancient Roman province of Asia. And he's sitting there alone, surrounded by other prisoners. And he's thinking about the fact that that life, in fact, he, he tells us how bad it is. It says, I am the one... And if you get all the way down to to verse 9, I am your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom. He says, I am am one who when Jesus sent this message to me, when he lifted the lid and and disclosed the, the person of Christ, he says, I was in tribulation. What kind of tribulation was he in? Well, though there were probably many other prisoners, John was far from his family. As far as we know from church history, he had not been allowed to see his wife or children. He was totally isolated from them. He was a prisoner of the emperor himself. He had no family to encourage him. As far as his colleagues, his own brother James, as well as every other apostle, even Paul, had systematically been hunted down. How would you like to have a list of names, and your name is on it, and you can cross them off and say, "Mm, caught him and beheaded him, Mm, they ran him through with spears, Mm, they pulled him between two chariots and split him in half. Mm, they crucified that one. Oh, they crucified that one. And all of a sudden, you're the last name on the list. See, that's where John was. Every one of his close friends had been hunted down and murdered. He had no dear old friends left to encourage him. And it's a real, a real possibility. It wouldn't be a stretch to say, because he says it in verse 9, that John was experiencing a very hard time in his life. And so knowing that, what does the Lord do? Well, he reminds him that even though many years back when he followed Jesus, Jesus called and taught him and and led him all over and answered all of his questions, that even though that same Jesus had ascended back to heaven, what John needed to be reminded was that Jesus was still the same. That even though Jesus had, had been cruelly beaten and then crucified and bled to death and then stuck through with a spear and put into a tomb. And even though he had walked out alive, that he was still the same Jesus. And even though Jesus had stayed around for 40 days, John must have been overwhelmed at at the change in his resurrection power. 
But then when Jesus ascended back into heaven and the last thing that John saw were his feet going up in the clouds, from that point onward, he must have felt like things aren't the same. Jesus seems far away. He's, I don't see him anymore. And that's why this first chapter was written to John first and to the first century church to tell them nothing has changed. Jesus is just like he was when you knew him in Galilee. Jesus is just like it was when you knew him when he was in his ministry. And that's why John sees him starting in verse 13. And when he sees him, he looks just like he looked when he walked around the Sea of Galilee. For John, if we had been in his sandals trudging along the paths of Patmos, we could easily confess Jesus was far away. For someone who had known him face to face like John did, he seemed so far away. But Jesus said, no, I haven't changed. In fact, the writer of Hebrews put it this way, Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, for John, that was when he was walking around the Sea of Galilee. Today, for John, that was when he saw him on the island of Patmos and forever. And it's the same for us. Jesus Christ never changes. Jesus wanted his church to know, look at chapter 1 again in verse 1, he sent to his servants. God gave him this, this pulling up the lid in Revelation showing Jesus Christ for his church to know. You know what that means? They needed to know it. They needed to know that Jesus hadn't changed because it wasn't just John that felt that they were removed from Christ. The church was feeling that, that, that things had changed. He isn't around us anymore. And this whole book is, is totally built around this reality that Jesus Christ is here and he is the same. And he's doing what he used to do and he's doing it now and he's with us. So John had to see Christ today and the flawless record of that meeting is recorded for us in this book. It's an eyewitness account. John, who's trudging along Patmos, all of a sudden hears a voice and sees Jesus and writes down what he saw. And this is what he wrote. And we're going to read this morning only verses 9 through 13. So if you're in Revelation 1, we're going to read verses 9 through 13. And especially this morning, we're going to focus only on, on verse 13. And in verse 13, in that one verse, there are two descriptions of Christ that are the first thing when the box was opened that we get to see. Now, it's very interesting. If, if you wanted to share something special and you says, okay, now look, and you opened it, what, what they saw would be what was most important for them to see. The first thing God discloses, reveals, unveils for us is Jesus Christ as he is this moment. And we'll see it. Well, verses 9 through 13, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Remain standing, we're going to pray. And this is what God breathed out through John. I, John, Revelation 1, 9, both your brother, so he's writing to believers, and your companion, that means he was going through what they were going through. Now look how he describes the Christian life. In the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Tribulation means to be squashed. Uh, the word thlipsis means to be, to be crushed or squashed and, and just have everything pressing in on you. So he said, the Christian life, everything is just squashing me. And the kingdom, that means, you know, I'm seeking the Lord's rule in my life. And the patience, that means I'm trusting him even though I don't know what's happening. Of Jesus Christ, so there's his description, was on the island that is called Patmos. And why were you there, John? For the word of God, because he was proclaiming it, believing it, sharing it, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He testified that he knew Christ, he believed him, that he was real, that he was true, the living God. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Wow, he was still observing that first day of the week set aside, to, to worship the risen Christ. He was in the Spirit. doesn't mean the Spirit was in him. It meant he was walking in the Spirit. He had surrendered. It's called the Spirit-filled life. He was experiencing it. I was in the Spirit on Sunday or the Lord's Day. I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, verse 11, saying, and here's Christ, his, his introduction, audio introduction, I am the Alpha first letter of the Greek alphabet, and the omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, 
And then for those who didn't know in uh, Greek, the first and the last, so they would get the idea. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he lists them, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. We saw last time, verse 20 identifies that as the churches, representing all the churches. Now, here's verse 13. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, in other words, walking around the churches, and here's what he saw. One like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. He saw Jesus. In Jesus' most favorite description of himself, Jesus loved to call himself the Son of Man, and he saw Jesus dressed in what John would have recognized as the outfit a priest wore. And so he sees Jesus as a man, human, and as a perfect priest. And what's amazing is that's the first thing that God knew John needed. And that's the first thing that God knew the church of the first century needed. And guess what? It's what God knew that you and I need to make it for him today. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you'd open your word to us in an unusual way. I pray that as we see Christ with the lid taken off, as God, as you give to us the gift of seeing Jesus in a new and powerful way, the way you want us to think about him every day as we go through life. I pray we wouldn't just hear this, but that we would apply this in our life and do something about it. And may that doing start today in our lives for your glory and by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I just want to show you, starting in verse 13, we aren't going to track back through 9, 10, 11, and 12, but starting in verse 13, those two elements, and just take them apart with you. Remember, Jesus is, is portraying the fact that John needed to see that he is the same, Hebrews 13, 8 says, yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same when he called John, when John walked with him, when John saw him going up into heaven as he was 60 years later. Now think, that's how long it's been since John saw Jesus. Now I haven't seen Jesus for 55 years. John hadn't seen him for 60 years. After face to face, intimately knowing Christ, remember what John was called? He was called the one whom Jesus loved. He was the one that was closest to Christ. He was the one when they would sit, kind of like we're going to have in our uh, we're going to experience a little bit of the Last Supper setting when we have our, our Passover Seder. But they used to sit in a horseshoe-shaped triclinium, it was called, a three-sided table. And they would have their feet like spokes outward from the center wheel, their feet out, and they would lean on this table, and in the center would be the food. And, and here is Jesus, and the person that was most special was the one that was right in front of them on this you know, leaning on this table because they could lean back and, and put their head on the chest of the person behind them and talk to them. Or the person behind them could lean forward and whisper to them. So the closest person was the one that was right in front of you or right behind you. And that's where John always was. So John was used to closeness. And so Jesus said, you're used to closeness? I'm still close. And that's the whole idea of verse 13. Look how he describes it. When John saw Jesus, now, now pencil these in your mind. We're going we're gonna to do two in verse 13, but starting in verse 14, Lord willing, next time, there is the, the string. It's the first of the string that, that, that follows uh, of all of these sevens. Now, we've already had seven churches, but this is the first string of sevens that has to do with Christ. And starting in verse 14, it talks about his head and his hair and his eyes and his mouth and his feet and his hands. And, and there are seven descriptions of Christ, and we're going to come to those. But, but look at this first one in verse 13. When John sees Jesus Christ, the first thing he sees is he's one like a son of man. That's to remind him he's still 100% human. 
you know, after that whole grave and resurrection and walking, remember Jesus walked through walls? Probably John was a little shaken that he's not like he used to be. He's not so human. He's kind of God. Well, he was 100% God. But what the early church struggled with was Jesus is still 100% human. And this was Jesus saying, I am still like the Son of Man. I can truly have compassion. I can feel your needs. I am human. I understand you. I want to remind you. You know, the early church really struggled with not the deity, but the humanity of Christ. And they really struggled with that, that he really understood, that he really felt, that he really had compassion because he was so powerful as God. Second thing, it's connected. Look at the end of verse 13. Jesus is dressed like a priest to remind us of the promise of Scripture. He's our great high priest. Now, for us, priests, I mean, we're not Catholic. We don't have a priest. You know, that's kind of like, what? That's so removed from us. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the first century and backward into the Old Testament. The, God had designed this, this elaborate meeting place. It was called the tent of the meeting, the tabernacle. And later it was enlarged into the temple. And what the temple was all about was simply this. God says, I am God and you're not. Stay out. That's what the whole temple and tabernacle was about. It had walls. It had all these gates. And, and it, was, it was very guarded by this, this army of priests. And the only way you could get to God, who said, I want you to come to me, but you can only come through a priest. So priests were those that represented you to God and represented God back to you. And so Jesus shows himself in verse 13 as completely human and as the ultimate representative of God. He is the priest. He is the representation of the invisible God. He is the one who can defend us. He is the one who can cleanse us. He is the one who can, can intercede for us. So verse 13 shows Christ two ways. He reminds us he's completely human. That's the first part, one like a son of man. And that means he can have compassion and feel our needs. And secondly, he shows us that he's our, our great high priest. He is clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. That's Jesus praying for us, defending us, representing us. So the purpose of Revelation, remember, was to remind them. Did they know Jesus was human? Yes. Did they know he was a priest? Yes. It says it all the way through the Bible. They needed this reminder, and so do we. Today, more than anything else, we need to experience Christ like he is. Now, how do you experience the first part of verse 13? Well, the way we experience that is realize Jesus can feel my struggles completely. Have you ever thought about that? Do you ever feel sometimes like Jesus can't feel what you're going through or doesn't want to? Probably be a more common feeling like he doesn't like what I'm doing so he doesn't, isn't interested at all. Jesus can feel my needs completely. All the lessons of Revelation are previous truths that God wants to remind us about. So let me show you the previous truth. Back up, you're in the end of the Bible, back up about eight books to Hebrews, okay? I'm going to just give you a quick run through. Hebrews is the, is the kind of the go-between between between the Old Testament revelation in the tabernacle and temple about all that God wanted and the sacrifice and priesthood and Jesus Christ. And it shows that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment and the culmination and supreme over all those things. Now look at Hebrews chapter 2, because I love this. Because to grasp what's being said in the first half of Revelation 1.13, we have to understand, listen, the purpose of the 100% humanity of Christ. Why was Jesus revealed as being 100% human? Hebrews 2 tells us. Look starting in verse 14 of Hebrews 2. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, that's us, we're human, we have flesh and blood, continuing in verse 14, he himself likewise shared in the same. So this is a declaration Jesus shared in our humanity, in flesh and blood. Now why? Continue verse 14. That through death... He might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. The only way Jesus could destroy the devil and in, the, in God's plan was to not do it from the throne, but to come down and become like us, one with us in our humanity, and as a human, resist and completely obey 
and do what God wanted. Resist the devil and completely obey God. And in that process, become a perfect. Why did Jesus live 33 years? Why? So he lived a perfect life, every detail of life. He lived perfectly so that he could accumulate all righteousness so that we could be clothed with his perfection and so that he could be the perfect substitute for our sins. And so keep reading in verse 14. So that he could destroy him, they had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15, here's the purpose of his humanity, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He had to release us from our fears because he's one of us and he shows us that he overcame. Verse 16, for he does not give aid to angels, but he gives aid to the seed of Abraham. Verse 17, therefore in all things, this is talking about Christ, he, that's Jesus, had to be made like unto his brethren, that's us, that he, Jesus, might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Do you see how in Hebrews these two concepts we see in verse 13 are linked? Jesus is the son of man wearing this priest outfit. He is just like us and he is representing us as our priest. But keep going. He had to be made like his brethren, verse 17 says, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make propitiation, uh, propitiation. Did you know that Greek word is the same word that's used for the mercy seat in the tabernacle? The mercy seat is called the hilasmas. Propitiation is the hilasmas. Jesus is the mercy seat where the blood was poured out to shield God's holy sight from seeing the sin beneath. So he could become the propitiation for the sins of the people. But here's verse 18. For in that he himself, that's Jesus, has suffered being tempted. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you catch that? Jesus has suffered, agonized through temptation. Never forget that. The next time that you or I face something that, that, is, that is drawing us away from God and we're struggling to say no to it and say yes to God, Jesus, look what it says, suffered being tempted and he is able to aid those who are tempted. Because Jesus was 100% human, he, he was tempted just like we are and he overcame so he can come to our aid. That's the whole message of verse 18. So God wants to unwrap something for us. That's a truth that's been in the Bible for a long time. But in Revelation, God pulls back the lid and he says, do you see that? Do you see Jesus? Jesus is 100% human. He knows what you're going through. He feels what you're feeling. He struggles like you struggle. He says he has felt the same temptations. He knows what you're going through. Now, keep going to Hebrews chapter 4 because the same idea keeps getting repeated. In the fourth chapter of Hebrews, look at verse 15. And, and this is Jesus reinforcing this truth that he's felt what we feel and he's wrestled with what we wrestle with. And so he becomes the only one that can really say to us, I know what you're going through. This is what he says. For we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. Can you imagine someone coming up to you and saying, oh man, I know what you're going through. And you're going through a job loss, a house loss, a car loss, and a health loss. And they're in a nice, comfortable house, a nice, comfortable car with a secure job and healthy as a horse. And they go, man, I really can feel for you. And you go, oh, yeah, I bet you can, you know. Jesus comes, and look what he says. I'm not a high priest who can't sympathize. Sum patheo is a Greek word. Sum with, patheo, feel. He feels with us. How does he feel with us? Because look at the end of verse 15. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. See, Jesus is characterized as, as the one who is filled with compassion. Jesus is most often described as, as being compassionate. He, in fact, every time the verb showing compassion is used in the New Testament, it's used 12 times in the New Testament. Every time it's used of Christ. How do you like that? 100%. When Jesus says, I've got the corner on compassion, the word compassion means to feel. Uh, the word splanknoi, actually splanknos is your intestines. It means to feel viscerally, in a positive way, in the depths of your being, to feel what someone else is feeling. Jesus said, I feel for you. 
as humans, we have so many needs, we have such deep feelings, we have such great struggles, it often helps to know that someone understands. Have you ever talked to someone that says, you just, I'm really struggling with this, and all of a sudden they get this glazed over look. You know, and you know that they've zoned out. They don't feel what you're feeling. They're just kind of trying to listen, but they don't feel it. They don't, they don't understand. Jesus said, I understand. What we long for in all of our temptations is to know someone knows what we're struggling with. And what's amazing is Jesus understands better than anybody else. He says, I'm the best. He said, I've suffered all that you're suffering. I have felt all the pains you feel. And he says, you know what my most frequent emotion is? Not disgust, not impatience, not frustration. Why are you doing that again? He said, do you know what I most often feel when I see you struggling? I feel compassion. I struggle with you. See, that's, that's the wonder of the gospel. That's why the boy hit with a baseball bat couldn't believe it. Never met anybody that could feel what he was feeling. See, Jesus says, I feel what you're feeling. I know. I've suffered like you have. Jesus feels compassion as he watches a struggle. Let, let me show you what I mean. Turn back to Matthew chapter 20. Uh, with me. Now we're going to the first gospel, back to the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew 20. Instead of me just saying all this, you can see it yourself. And you can mark it. This is the last verse of chapter 20. And this is Jesus in, in the uh, two blind men, you know, crying out, needing help. Now look, look what Jesus does in verse 34, the last verse of the chapter. So Jesus had compassion that word means he felt on the inside. He was moved with a feeling of, of feeling what they were going through. But he doesn't just, see that's another element that, that he's not only the son of man that can feel it, he does something about it. See, he doesn't just say, oh man, I know what you're going through, and then he walks away. He does something. Look what he does in verse 34. He had compassion and he touched the point of their need. What did these blind men need? What was their most pressing need? They couldn't see. So what did he do? Did he say, man, I understand what you're going through, and he closed his eyes so he could temporarily feel? No. He touched their eyes. See, that's the neat thing, and that's, that's where we're going this morning. Do you understand Jesus is here? He's like a son of man. He's tracking with you. He says, I know exactly what it is you're going through. I know that how, how you're having a hard time with your boss or with your teacher or with the people that work for you or you're having a trouble with your family or with your marriage partner or whoever. And he says, I'm tracking with you. But it doesn't stop there. God in human flesh, Jesus Christ says, I would like to touch that area of need in your life. I would like to help you. Not take it away, always. Did you know the Lord doesn't want to take away our problems? He wants to give us the strength to go through them because kind of like we were at Go Lake and uh, I was speaking there and the kids found a caterpillar cocoon and they decided it was time for the butterfly to come out. So they opened it. And here's this, you know, monarch butterfly that's completely that big and guess what? Because it didn't have to struggle and push and, and force its way out of that, that little cocoon, in that process is how it got each of the joints strengthened to support those wings. So our little monarch couldn't fly. It just walked around like this. And you know what? A lot of times we do that to people. We take away their problems and they walk around like this. Because if they were allowed to stay and by God's grace overcome, then they could have his initial desire and plan for them. And so Jesus wants to touch us right where our problems are and help us through them. Uh, here's another one. Look at, at uh, Mark chapter 6. Just go through the rest of Matthew and go to Mark chapter 6. It's also verse 34. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And what I like is what Jesus says here in Mark 6 verse 34. He came out and he saw a great multitude. What were they doing? Well, look at the end of the verse. They were like sheep not having a shepherd. They were, they, you know what that means? They didn't know what they were doing. A sheep without a shepherd is just kind of wandering around, rah, rah, you know, just not knowing what to do. And it, it won't eat, won't drink. It's just all mixed up. And that's what they look like. So what does Jesus think of mixed up people? 
people whose lives are just, just in a tailspin. And they can't eat, they're not in the Word, they can't drink, they just feel horrible. What does he think about? What's his first emotion? Well, look at verse 34. When Jesus saw them, like sheep without having a shepherd, he saw this great multitude. It says he was moved with compassion. And, and look what it, it says. Because they were like a sheep not having a shepherd, so he began to teach them what they needed to know. He began to teach them many things. When Jesus walked around and saw what they were going through, it moved him to compassion. When Jesus sees the struggles and the confusion and all the temptation the devil flings at fallen humanity, Jesus feels compassion. Never forget, Christ's most frequent emotion is not anger, it's not disappointment, and it's not frustration. His most often expressed emotion is feeling for us as we're struggling through our needs and our challenges and our fears. Jesus is most characterized in his humanity by a love that shows itself in compassion. You know what's amazing is all the way through Christ's ministry, have you ever noticed that, that the blind, the lepers, the lame, the people that were dropped through the roof and plopped in front of Jesus, did you ever notice that Jesus was accessible? He didn't say, oh, you know, I need a security contingent, you know. They were always pushing through and even grabbing the tassel of his robe. Why? Because they knew he understood and felt with them. And that's what he wants from us today. If we're weak, he understands. He looks upon us with compassion. He says, reach out to me. I'll give you strength. If we're afraid, he's acquainted with all of our fears. And he says, I will be with you. Isn't it amazing how, how when people get afraid, if you come and, and spend time with them, all of a sudden, especially children, they just relax and they're not afraid anymore? How can we lose that childlike faith? How come we can't just say, Jesus, you're with me? I won't be afraid. Are we alone? Jesus was alone. He was in the wilderness alone. He was in Gethsemane alone. He was in the darkness of the cross alone. He knows what it's like to be alone. He feels our pain. And when he sees us with those struggles, he feels compassion. Well, back to Revelation and let's end this morning because Revelation 1, verse 13, is where we're going to end. The first half of verse 13 says, Jesus can feel my needs completely. He's human. He's full of compassion. He's right now one like the Son of Man. But look at the second half of verse 13. Here's what the compassion of Christ prompts. Jesus, who feels all we're going through, doesn't just feel. He also responds. That's what the second half of the verse, where it says, he was clothed in a white garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. You know what that means? He was a priest coming out to dispense. Did you know in the Old Testament... Priests didn't hang around the tabernacle. They went out, and they were kind of like in the community helping the people. They were the experts on health. They were the experts on diet. They were the experts on how to deal with diseases. They were kind of like the medical personnel. They're the ones that kept contagious diseases from going out. They understood foodborne, bloodborne, illness, and, and all that. And they, they were instructed by God how to help the people. So when you see someone with this outfit down to the feet and this sash around their chest, you go, there comes a priest. And that's Jesus. He doesn't just know. He comes to us in our problems. You remember every time the disciples are out there, the boat's sinking, where's Jesus? Walking to them across the storm. He was the one who came to them in their need. Forgiving sins was Christ's greatest and most enduring and powerful miracle. I, I always think about how Jesus would come to them uh, when, when they were struggling with one thing and, and he would actually speak to the deeper need. Remember I told you about the guy that was dropped down through the ceiling and they opened it up and they plopped him in front of Jesus? This man, actually the, the wording says his body was twisted. He looked like a pretzel. You know, one of those, those new kind that they twist like this. His body was twisted like a pretzel and they had brought him on a pallet and he was all, you know, and he looked up at Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and saw his greatest need. And it wasn't that his body was twisted. It was that his soul was twisted. And Jesus looked down at that man, and he said, your sins are forgiven. 
And all the people started snickering, the religious leaders. And they said, you can't forgive sins. Besides that, we can't even tell if you really did. And so Jesus, who knew what they were thinking, looked at him and said, so that you might know who I really am. He said, why don't you get up? And the twisted body came together, and the man rolled up his bed and sped out of there. And everyone was in amazement. What was his greatest need? What the priest could do. He needed his soul repaired. You see, we have a world of people that look great on the outside and they're twisted on the inside. And Jesus, the Son of Man, says, I know what you're going through on the inside. And I come to you and I can do what you most need. I'm the only one that can fix your insides, your soul, your heart, your mind. So Jesus comes and he knows that we have fallen. He knows our frailties. He knows we're weak. He knows we're tempted. He knows that we sin. He is one like the Son of Man. But he doesn't just stop knowing it. He walks to us like a priest. And he said, I'm here to fix and to meet your deepest needs. That's what John needed when he was on Patmos. That's why he was supposed to write it down. That's what the early church needed to know as it was written and distributed. And then by way of the inspired word we hold in our hands, it's what we need to know today. Jesus is the same. He's 100% human. He feels with us. Jesus is the same. What he feels and knows and sees, his emotion is not disgust. and Frustration, you did it again. But he rushes right up to us. And he says, can I help you in your time of need? Now, John 8, 11, Jesus said, I'm not going to condemn you, but leave your life of sin. When Jesus comes and meets us in our fear, he says, you can stop fearing. When he meets us in our defilement, he says, you can turn from that. When he meets us in our defeat and enslavement to sin, he says, you don't have to be enslaved. We have to make a choice to follow him. But Jesus understands. Well, this morning, the first disclosure God gives us is that Jesus is just like us and he knows exactly what's going on and he comes to us in our need. So now how should we respond to that? Well, the way we should respond to that is this morning maybe saying, Lord, thanks for not condemning me. Thank, thanks for not being disgusted and frustrated and mad at me. Thanks for being moved with compassion when you see my weakness. And Lord, come to me now and help me I want to turn from that fear, turn from that sin, turn from that sin that so easily besets me. I want to follow you. See, every time Jesus comes, he offers a new beginning. Let's close this morning by standing. It's time to, to go. What we're going to do is stand. And in just a moment, we're going to sing to the Lord. Um, there's a little song I love. It goes this way. Um, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my king, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. We're going to sing that to the Lord. And right where, since there are no words, we're not putting the words up, so you can close your eyes, you can sing it to the Lord, you can do whatever you want. But while we're singing that, I'm going to be down front and the elders are going to come. I'm going to close in prayer. And after I close in prayer, if you need more than just a prayer in the pew, if you actually need to talk to someone, the Bible says bear one another's burdens. There are some things we go through in life that are too heavy. They're not our backpack. It's like a boulder. And we need someone to help us. We need someone to pray with us. We need someone to encourage us to share scriptures. We don't even know where they are. That's why God called and gifted and chose elders. The word elder in Greek means a pastor, a shepherd. We have, uh, we have 15 wonderful, godly, gifted men who are shepherding this flock. And they come at the end of the services. And if you want to talk to someone, pray with someone, if you want to share a need that, that they will walk through life with you, and that's why they're here. And after that's over, if you're brand new and you've never yet been to our visitor reception, if I've never met you and gotten to know your family, I'll be in the gymnasium, the fellowship center, right outside across the lobby at the end of the service. The elders will be here. And the good news is Jesus is right next to you in your pew. Okay? Let's sing to him that song as our closing this morning. 
I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to pray. The elders are coming wherever they are. Come now there they come they're going to be standing here with their bibles to pray with you and i'll be back at the visitor reception let's just thank the lord as we close father in heaven i thank you for your word i thank you that you are here as the living and abiding word of god that you are able to meet every need that you know where we are that you're moved with compassion for us in whatever we're going through this day I pray that tonight as we see David, a good man that had bad things happen to him, that our hearts would be drawn to the fact that you are not disgusted with us, but you have a plan and you are with arms open wide this morning waiting for us to flee to you in our time of need. May we do that. May you be glorified. We love you, Lord. We've told you that and now may we live it. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray and all of God's people said, amen.